Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. The theme for tonight's program is a, a theme that actually crosses the journeys of all the folk that you've heard on this program for the last five years. My guest tonight is Joseph Pierce. He's an author from England, now living in the United States, working at Ave Maria College. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But he's an author that I read a book of his a couple years ago that I, even, not just because he's sitting here, but I still think it's one of the best books I've ever read called Literary Converts. And it's because of his writing, Literary Converts, and, and he's written biographies on Chesterton, Tolkien, and just recently a biography of Hilaire Belloc. But as we talked about a theme of his journey into the church, the theme that just jumped out at us is the, the power of the written word, specifically the power of the written word for conversion, for the proclamation of the gospel. I would have to say that every guest that we've had in this program for the last five years a part of their journey involved being touched to the heart by good Catholic literature, either contemporary or classic Catholic literature. In fact, I still believe that one of the main reasons that so many people are not Catholics is because they've never taken the time to read a book, a Catholic book about the Catholic Church written by a Catholic. I hadn't for the first 40 years of my life. But once discovering Catholic literature, uh, it, it's such an awakening, a, a heart opening, a mind expanding because of the depth of Catholic theology, uh, literature, fiction, nonfiction. And uh, that's what Joseph will talk about tonight in his conversion to the Catholic Church. He comes from a different place than the majority of my guests, and that's the excitement of hearing a new story every week. Remember, you're an important part of this program, so if you want to give us a call with a question for Joseph, call us at one 800 2219460 or send us an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. Joseph, welcome to the Journey Home. Good to be here. I look forward to having you here ever since I read Literary Converts yeah. about three years ago, I think. Is, is that about right? When I would have bought it in England? If you put it in England about three years ago. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I told everybody that was the best book I had read that year, and I still think it's a wonderful book. Well, thank you. And, but actually, when I read it, I didn't know you were a convert. All right. I, <laughs> okay. Well, that's why I was amazed. I really loved the subject of, of literary converts because, you know, being a convert myself, I wanted to know how other people got, got yeah, here. Yeah. So. Of course, you would talk, you'll share with us later how each of those people in many ways had an influence on your own, yeah. your own journey. And uh, of course, the other, when I discovered that was when I found out that you married a girl that my wife and I knew, uh, Susanna, yeah. and uh, you've just been married how many months now? Well, we, married, we married in April in That's Steubenville, right. Ohio, That's so right. we're still in the first year of our marriage. We're expecting our first baby next That's March. That's right. So you just told the world that you are Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> there we are. Well, let's begin, as we do every week, and invite you to share your early spiritual journey with us. Okay, well, I was brought up in uh, the East End of London, in England, and uh, at a very early age, I became very embittered about certain aspects of life and had a very mm. negative view. And from the age of 14, I started to take an interest in um, political racism, what would be probably termed white supremacist politics. Mm. And I um, Is it parallel to what we experience here in the States? In that, I mean, what, over here, we had the term skinheads or, yeah. or uh, skinheads. Nazi. Skinheads were part of it. Uh, Certainly, aspects of the people involved in the organization I was a member of could be called neo-Nazis. Okay. Right. Um, so, uh, the organization was called the National Front, and it was a, a big organization in England in the 1970s, getting many votes, and it had a sort of racist agenda. I was uh, very angry, I suppose, an angry young man, and uh, when I was 14, and uh, I just got involved in this politics, I, think I joined the party when I was 15, and I had to lie about my age because you had to be 16 to join, <laughs> and um, and I suppose at that age you, you, you're you're you almost have a vacuum in your mind because you're so young, you haven't developed, you have no real experience of life, and being a sort of bibliophile, just a, a lover of books, I just read everything that mm. this this organisation threw at me, uh, all the publications, all the books. So of course this filled the void, and I had there was nothing in there. And then really, by the time that I was um, 16, uh, it was all that I knew. And I made what I now call um, my Faustian pact, my sort of my my bargain with the devil, if you like. It wasn't obviously 
<laughs> worded that way in my head at the time, but looking back on it, it's how I see it, is that all that I wanted to do, and I was 15 years old, all that I wanted to do was to work full time for the National Front. Yeah. And when I was 16, um, I was offered a job full time, and as a result, I uh, gave up all my education uh, and just worked full time for this organization. And uh, had a meteoric rise to prominence in it. I edited two of its magazines and was the youngest ever member of its governing body at the age of 17 and mm. chairman of the Young National Front and, you know, on its executive council. So I really was completely sucked into this mm. sort of vortex of extremist politics. And um, I edited two magazines. One was called Nationalism Today, which was supposed to be sort of more highbrow, sort of ideological. Uh, but I also ed edited a magazine called Bulldog, which was the magazine of the Young National Front. Mm. And this had a very much a tabloid agenda. And its, it, it's, its aim basically was to stir up tensions between the races. Mm. Uh, and so I was prosecuted uh, for, uh, under the Race Relations Act for, for publishing material that was likely to incite racial hatred. Uh, and received a six-month prison sentence. Mm. Uh, and then I was very much a militant. I, I, was, I was locked up in the same sort of block of cells as an IRA person, and I, I detested the IRA. I was a militant loyalist, but we sort of were kept apart, and, and I sort of weight-trained and trained in prison. I was a political prisoner. That's the way I saw myself. And then I got out of prison and I carried on editing this magazine, and. Uh, Three or four years later, received a second prison sentence for the same offence and served six months of 12 month sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's sort of my life really up to the age of 25. I spent my 21st and 25th birthdays in prison. So. Well, interesting, if you, would, if you were to stand back at that point and take a trajectory of life, your conviction, your commitment at age 14 had led to two prison terms already and you know, if the trajectory had continued to go, who knows where you would have ended up. Indeed. You know, if yeah. you look back at that time, you're a different man today than you were then, I'm sure. Uh, if, if Think about it. If, if somebody would, have, would describe how they would have known you back then, would they have described you just as a really angry, bitter young man? Or? I, I think it's probably dangerous to paint anybody, including ourselves, completely black. And I think there was, you know, there was something inside me that was, uh, that was seeking and grappling for truth. Uh, and looking in all the wrong directions for it most of the time, but nonetheless, there's this seed. After all, we're all made yeah. in the image of God, so I wouldn't want to paint myself completely, you know, uh, dark and evil. But uh, on the other hand, I was very much eaten up with a lot, lot of bitterness and a lot of anger, yeah. and this was in many and respects self-consuming. Sold out to that. Yeah. You know, our, our theme was this idea of the power of the written word. And, of course, we're, we're seeing it in the angle of the gospel and conversion. And yeah. I look back at that time. Uh, you said, for, on the one hand, you did mention that books had a big influence oh, on your journey at that point. It's the power of the written word in a negative sense, that if you read good books, fine. But if you read bad books, you know, mm -hmm. you can, it can lead you in all sorts of wrong directions. And if you're young and your mind is fairly empty of ideas and malleable, uh, then these, these bad ideas that you read in books, and I read every book that I could get on the subject that I was interested in, they fill your mind. And you, you read them, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, in an unexamined sense? You, just, this, you knew this was of the material you liked, and so you just accepted it hook, line, and sinker? I asked the people that were older than me and wiser, in inverted okay. commas, you know, the people that knew more about the ideology than I did, what are the books I should read to really understand okay. this? And they gave me a list of books, and very dutifully I went through and read one after the other mm -hmm. after the other. Read all the magazines out in the market and that uh, sort of area of politics. Yeah. So I, I just really saturated myself in, in extreme right-wing politics. Well, you know, it, it, there's an interesting connection there uh, in that you have this, this group of literature that in, your, in that case infiltrated, uh, infused your mind with this way of looking at life and convic convicted you and, and confirmed you in that lifestyle. But the literature that, that did that to you was literature you received from people yeah. that you trusted. Yes. And so th there's a sense when it com comes back to, you've got the, you, certainly some people can just pick up a random book and read it, but, but the reality is that often what we read and trust is because someone that we trusted recommended it. Yes, you know, and that, I, I, course, that's why you're on the program. We want you to tell the people the right books to read. <laughs> <laughs> the right books now, yeah, the good right. books. Yeah. 
That's right. All right. What opened your heart to the church then? In the midst of prison, right? I mean, that's where we've left you. Well, yes. Uh, basically, we have to go back a little bit because I look upon the 1980s. We left. We left the second prison sentence was I, w- I went to prison in December 1985 when I was 24. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had always been very anti-Catholic. Um, I was uh, an agnostic. I was never brought up in a religious. Um, setting at all. I only mm-hmm. ever went to church for weddings. Uh, and, 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 you know, it, was, it wasn't a question of hating God. God was irrelevant, you know. Um, mm. So I was an agnostic. In the books you were reading, God was never part of the equation at all. Uh, so, some, some of them had sort of versions of Christianity, you know, mm-hmm. uh, hitting, hitting problems from all sorts of angles. Okay. But it was, in those cases, I almost looked upon the religious, but that was the insignificant part of it. Mm. You know, the important part was the politics. So, um, but in so I was a member of the Orange Order, which is a, a, a secret society, sort of pseudo Masonic secret society, which is Protestants only. Only Protestants can join. And although I was an agnostic, my parents were Church mm. of England, so therefore I qualified. It's just ironic. Um, <laughs> but but no, no, obviously it's an anti-Catholic organization, so no Catholics are allowed to join. And I really joined it as a political statement of my loyalism, my loyal, you know, my Ulster loyalism, and my uh, detestation of the Catholic Church. Mm. And as a member of the Orange Order, um, we even opposed the the Holy Father's visit to to England in uh, in 19, I think it was 1980, soon after he mm. he, he he was elected Pope. Uh, on the basis that never been a, a pope had visited England since the Reformation, and you know we we mm. don't want a pope here now, you know, so there was that, and of course to say the the racist politics, and in the midst of all this, um, I was interested in looking for alternatives to uh, capitalism and communism. I was anti-communist, but when the communists attacked. Uh, me for for being you're just a, a shock trooper of capitalism big business i thought well no i'm not i, mean, I'm, I may be <laughs> i may be i may be anti-communist but that doesn't mean i want a, a multinational capitalist you know plutocracy so i said there must be another way you know it can't just be this can't just be the choice between these two there must be other ways of looking at this and someone said have you thought about the the distributist ideas of chesterton and belloc and i who are they, you know? <laughs> but someone said, well, you should read a, an essay called Reflections on a Rotten Apple by, um, by Chesterton. And this was uh, in, in an essay, uh, in a book of essays. And it was just one essay. And two-thirds of the way through the book was this one essay. And the rest of the... So I picked it up and started reading from page one. And the rest of the, the books, the essays in this book, were all defences of the Catholic Church from various modern attacks on it. And I think it was C.S. Lewis said that... Um, that a, a good atheist can't be too careful of the books he reads. <laughs> uh, because I, I felt very much like that, because I, I read this and thought, I can't fault any of these arguments. You know, Chesterton's defending the Catholic Church. And you can imagine, if you're a Protestant bigot, you know, uh, and, 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 and a racist, this was a very discur- disconcerting <laughs> experience. You're sort of turning or undermining a lot of your, your treasured beliefs had, and prejudices. Had you figured before then, had you taken the, the presumption that you could probably discount any arguments that had come your way up until reading that? I just assumed that the Catholic Church was just a, a, a load of medieval superstition okay. and not worth taking seriously and, uh, you know, uh, was something foreign and something yeah. pernicious and, you know, and, 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 un, and un-English. <laughs> um, and of course, Chesterton, quintessentially English, uh, with all, these, all of these defenses of the Catholic Church. And, and in the midst of all this, while I was reading this, this was in 1980, uh, a Jehovah's Witness knocked on the door. And I just thought, well, rather than sort of just say I'm not interested, I'd pretend that I was a Catholic, just <laughs> as a sort of intellectual exercise for a bit of fun, if you like, using these a- arguments that Chesterton had got there. And I was astounded at how powerful these arguments <laughs> were <laughs> against the Jehovah's Witness. So this was really the, the, the seeds that were planted then. But of course, I had filled my head with all this other ideology. Yeah. So, you know, I was still young, I was uh, 19 at this stage. So the, the following years, I was still a militant uh, in politics, but reading more and more Chesterton, reading Belloc, uh, through Chesterton and Belloc being introduced to C.S. Lewis. So reading these people and just trying to square the circle, you know, <laughs> trying to say, okay, they, they, everything they write is wonderful except their Christianity. 
which is in actual fact exactly what C.S. Lewis said about Chesterton. Uh, Chesterton has far more common sense than all of the moderns, except, of course, his Christianity. Christianity. You know, um, so I, th you know, that I, was the early C.S. Lewis. That was the early, early C.S. Lewis, yes, until right. C.S. Lewis, you know, his, conversion, his, yeah. his own conversion. So um, and this was the whole thing, and then this sort of led, I sort of like to look upon it as like an arm wrestle, you know, between yeah. sort of uh, our Lord working as best he can, you know, through the agents of Chesterton, Belloc, C.S. Lewis, and all of this sort of bitterness and hatred that's, that was inside me and the way that I'd rationalized it. It's sort of going like this, the sort of um, uh, most of the 1980s. And when I went to, to prison for the second time, somebody sent me a, a ro rosary when I was in prison. And I remember being in my cell with this rosary bead <laughs> and thinking, you know, I know that you're supposed to pray on each of these beads, but I had no idea what prayers to say or, or, or what to do with it. But I actually but you mentioned to but me earlier that you had never even prayed. That you could remember no, I, before. I, this, I'd never prayed. I'm not aware of ever having prayed before, mm. ever. And I remember laying on my bed in, in my cell in uh, Wormwood Scrubs Prison in, in, in England, in London, just sort of getting on each, going around these beads and just sort of saying a prayer on each of them. You know, a prayer of my own devising because I didn't know the, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, or the Our Father. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's... Uh, and that's my first groping prayer because someone sent me a rosary in prison in 1985. <laughs> so from 80, you came in when, 89, is that right? I was received into the church on St. Joseph's Day, 1989. Let's talk a little bit more about what happened between that prison. You get out of, out of prison at this point. Uh, I'm assuming you're not a changed man quite at that point, but talk about but the next four years of your journey. Yeah, well, I look upon the whole of the 1980s, really, from the first time I read uh, the Well and the Shallows by Chesterton to my reception of the church in 1989, the whole of that decade as a healing process, mm. whereas our, our Lord was continuing, refusing to, to give, give up <laughs> in spite of the hardness of my heart. Yeah. Um, and, and it was a healing process, and the sort of prison sentence was sort of two-thirds of the way there. But when I, I started to go to Mass in prison, and when I got out of prison, um, I did the best I could to disengage myself from politics. Um, it's quite difficult when you, you it's, all, it's all you've known since you were 15 years old and all of your friends yeah. are in it. Right. But uh, eventually I made the clean break and I had to make the clean break physically by leaving London uh, and moving out to, to a, a very quiet countryside area of, of England, uh, Norfolk. And, uh, and then once I moved out there, I started to go to Mass regularly and uh, uh, received instruction and was received into the church, say, in St. Joseph's Day, 1989. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, reading and writing had a, such a big impact on your journey, as you said. Now, as a Catholic, let's talk a little bit about this power of the written word, because that's become your life at this point. As a Catholic, how do you look at the significance? Talk a bit about the significance of that. Well, as you say, that uh, books were, were responsible for, for my going down a blind alley when I was young, uh, and they were also the road, obviously through grace, um, that led me out of the blind alley. So th th they, they played a very important, powerful role in my life. And really the first book that I wrote um, was, a, was a biography of Chesterton, and that was an act of thanksgiving for my conversion. And it was both an act of thanksgiving to our Lord and also for Chesterton himself for playing such an important part uh, in bringing me to Christ. So you see that the, the power of, 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 of the written word in that, in Chesterton. Mm. Uh, and, and I now wanted to bring Chesterton, the power of Chesterton, to a modern audience, yeah. which is why I, why I wrote the book. And that was the, the, the beginning. And really my writing uh, career since then, if, if career is the right word, vocation is probably a better one, mm. um, is, uh, has been to do the same thing, to bring the powerful written word of these of these literary figures to a modern public. Mm. You mentioned in passing uh, Chesterton, Belloc, Lewis, and, and of course you've written on Tolkien and you have your wonderful book, Literary Convert. might be good to tell the audience, because we might have some first timers tonight, that they've never heard Chesterton. They've never, have no idea who we're talking about when we say Belloc. Talk a little bit about them, because in your Literary Converts book, you, you give a, a snippet of their lives and their yeah. interconnections. 
Well, when I was when I was researching and writing the Chesterton biography, it became clear to me that Chesterton wasn't an individual standing alone, that he was in turn influenced by other people and influenced other people. In other words, he was an, a part of a, a huge network of mind and, and grace, net, network of minds and network of grace. And then I realized, of course, that that meant that none of these people could, should be looked at as individuals you know, literally standing on their own as, as being an island, mm -hmm. you know, in a sea of people. They were all part of a network of grace. And therefore, part of a Catholic literary revival was a movement, mm -hmm. a movement of grace, a movement of spirit, a movement of ideas, and a movement of beautiful writing. So th this is what I, I noticed with, with when, I, when I was writing the Chesterton book, and this is what inspired me to write Literary Converts. Chesterton was a convert to the Catholic faith um, and was a great defender of, of the church from all sorts of modern attacks on it, you know, from the atheist attack, the agnostic attack, the various uh, Protestant attacks upon the church. And he was just a wonderful defender and always full of uh, joie de vivre, you know, this joy of life, this bombustiousness. Uh, and Belloc was, was, was his, you know, a great friend of his and again a very powerful in influence on the Catholic literary revival. No. Uh, so we could go on forever. There's so many of these writers, you know. Um. Do something for me fascinating. You've written Leary Converts, and one of the beauties of this book, which is the one that I so highly recommend, published by Ignatius Press here in the United States, is that, again, you connect this, um, this chain of relationships. Yeah. And it's like I mentioned, we have the writings, but it's often people that recommend the writings. You know, yeah. it's, it's the people, really, behind the writings. If you could, quickly... A lot of these people are forgotten people because they were Catholics. But starting with Newman, name a chain of relationships that brings us up to today. Oh, okay, that's a good challenge. Uh, well, Newman was very, very important because he was very prominent and very well known. And so his conversion to the Catholic Church in 1845 can really be said to be the uh, beginning of the Catholic literary revival. Uh, he received into the church Gerard Manley Hopkins, who is probably the most influential poet of the last 150 years. Mm. Um, and he, and Jeremy Hopkins went on to become a Jesuit priest as well as a wonderful poet. Uh, Jeremy Hopkins knew Coventry Patmore, another convert poet of the Victorian era. Um, Newman and Manning had a great influence on, on the English decadence, Oscar Wilde and people like that, that, you know, that they, they went and lived a very decadent life and basically by putting their hand in the fires of hell we drew it quickly, and it's amazing how many of them actually became Catholics. You have a book on, on uh, the unmasking, uh, Oscar, of, the unmasking Oscar of Oscar Wilde. Yeah. yeah, which the idea of that being that he sort of held up, you know, these days as being sort of a, a, a gay icon. But in actual fact, all of his work is is very moral, and he he uh, was revolted himself by his uh, behaviour mm. and his downfall, and re revolted against that in in De Profundis uh, and in the Ballad of Reading Jail. Uh, and became a Catholic on his deathbed, which mm. many people don't know. Mm. Um, and you know, then you had Chesterton and Belloc in the beginning of the, the 20th century, and their H.G. Uh, Wells complained that they that they'd succeeded in putting a boozy halo around Catholicism. In, in other words, making it respectable and, and good and fun and and enjoyable. Mm. Um, and then from them you, that you had um, Ronald Knox, uh, Ronald Knox, very very um, uh, influential. And Evelyn Waugh uh, and Graham Greene in the 30s um, mm. uh, both became Catholics. T.S. Eliot, of course, became an Anglo-Catholic. Mm -hmm. And really, it's quite interesting when people say that orthodoxy is sort of somehow old-fashioned, because Gerard Manley Hopkins and T.S. Eliot were the two most influential poets, you know, without doubt at all, yeah. very innovative in their style, very profoundly orthodox in their message. Mm. Uh, so they were the avant-garde of, po of poetry. Mm while always being dynamically orthodox in their beliefs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so you have this power of orthodoxy, you know, and, 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 it, and it goes on beyond. And let, me, let me pull another name out that was there just before Chesterton, maybe contemporary. What was the name of the, 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 the son of the Anglican bishop, the convert? R. H. Benson? Yeah. R. H. Benson yeah. is wonderful, and, yeah. and he's written some beautiful novels. Uh, and Lord of the World, which is now back in print, um, I'm pleased to say, and, and I would recommend it, is that sort of, like a science fiction novel, it's a prophecy about the future, mm -hmm. and it's about a world it's set at just a hundred years' time, i.e., about where we are now, mm -hmm. you know, where euthanasia is common practice, where the Lord of the World is um, sort of is basically Satan, 
and he's uh, preaching tolerance to every everybody except except the church. Mm. Um, so, and then you, another Very interesting. another novel is like Come Rack, Come Rope, which is about yep. the persecution of, of yep. the Catholic Church under yep. Queen Elizabeth. You know, and, the, and the, the hanging and drawing and quartering. Of well, his conversion story is back in print, too. I've seen that. Oh, Confessions of a Convert. Yes, yes that's very back good. in print. I mean, and the reason I wanted you to do this for our audience is we have this chain yeah. of wonderful, well, they're converts, but great Catholic writers, yeah. a chain of them, a majority of them forgotten yeah. and pushed aside. Yeah. Talk about the reality of what we call white martyrs. Well, I say I think that we have here is the uh, the people that are wonderful writers but are out of step with the dogma of the age. And the dogma of the age is, say, liberal secularism. And so consequently, people are actually depriving themselves, even liberal secularists, yeah. you know, of great works of literature, great novels, great poetry. Uh, because, you know, th this attempt to snub these people out. Yeah. But to be fair, R. H. Benson, yes, he went through a doldrums, but we see now some of his books coming back into print. We certainly see a renewal of interest in Chesterton and Belloc now. Mm. Um, and I say the Belloc's importance as well is the whole addressing this historical bias. I mean, part of the reason that I was so anti-Catholic is that we're brought up with this view of Catholicism, which mm. is a result of the distorted history of England that we're all taught. And Belloc single-handedly said, you know, this history of the Reformation mm that's dished out to, to English people about the, that's the true history of England, it's not the truth at all. Now, this is not how it happened. You know, and, and if you actually look at the way that the English people were, that were persecuted for, for trying to stand by the Catholic faith at the time of the Reformation, and say priests were hanged, drawn and quartered, yeah. which is a hideous way to, to be killed. Is, is it true? This is the way I, I kind of understood things, but basically there became an official history that anyone graduating from Oxford or Cambridge, this is yep. the history they were taught and had to teach. Th yep. And it wasn't the truth. Yep. Is, that, is that correct? That's basically right. It's what, uh, what's, what's known as the, the Whig history. It's the, f it's the version of, of, of English history passed down by the Whig historians of the 18th century. And basically it's the Protestant line that, uh, you know, that the, the, the Reformation was uh, progressive, uh, and the Catholic Church was retrogressive and superstitious and would have held England back. And it's only because England threw off the Catholic Church it became a great imperial power. Um, and uh, you know, consequently, the, the Pax Britannica was a Protestant piece. Um, and this was just like, the official line. And, to, and, and it was literally, it was heresy to actually say this is not actually what happened. So Belloc was essentially preaching heresy. He, he, historical heresy, as far as they were concerned, yeah. To the English understanding of the church. And, and Precisely. That's, and that's why... But it was very important for me, and I'm sure for many, many hundreds and thousands of others, because when I started to read Belloc and read these histories, and it just made you realize, in actual fact, that, that the Reformation really was because uh, there was a, a landed aristocracy in England that wanted to get rich on church lands. It's as simple as that. First, we had the king wanting to get his own way. You had the aristocracy saying, well, if the king gets his own way, we can grab that, we can grab that. And you've got all these manor houses in England now that used to be abbeys and monasteries. I know. In fact, when, when they show a picture of a great English manor house on television, you know, I want to yell and say, excuse me, that's stolen property. Exactly. Because most of it is. It right? is, yeah. precisely. And you yeah. get, you know, they get things called Abbey Farm, these big manor houses. It's called Abbey Farm because it was an abbey. <laughs> yeah. Um, you're... I want to make sure we get a chance to talk about this new journal that you're starting, right? And yeah. the editor called the St. Austin Review Star. Basically, it's called Reclaiming Culture. Yes. Uh, it's a, and hopefully, they'll get a chance to see a picture of it. But why were you driven to do this? Talk about this wonderful magazine. Well, so we, we launched it in England in September, and we now have Arvin Maria College uh, you know, acting as U U.S. distributor. So we, we basically want to make it a transatlantic journal. And the idea being, as the, the title says, Reclaiming Culture. We want to, to show that Catholic, Catholicism is at the center of Western culture. So that means you know, that we want to show that to people. And so this magazine is a way of doing that. And what we really want to be able to do as well is to get um, American Catholicism and European Catholicism, because we have people that work for the magazine that translate from the French and the Italian, yeah. so that we can make the Catholic Church culturally Catholic. It, it's interesting you're doing that at the same time you're writing Belloc, because that's a Belloccian idea. Exactly. Isn't it the trans, was it to go over nationalities? Yes. 
and nations to see this the Christendom true, reestablished. Christendom, exactly. The, the true transcendence of, of, of the Catholic vision. Now, Europe and North America. Now, England's ideally place is English language, English speaking, but we're mm. on the continent of Europe. People with the magazine speak various languages and translating from various Europeans and also we can get Americans writing for a European audience. So it's a real transatlantic vision of Christendom, of culture, a Christian cultural vision. So that's what the magazine's about. And I'm very excited, as you've probably gathered. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, and I, I hope we've made a good plug to the audience for reading good Catholic literature and the power of that. Uh, and, and, and really reclaiming some of these wonderful authors that sadly have been, been forgotten because they weren't politi politically correct. Yep. Uh, in the eyes of those that had the power in society to, to determine what was going to be sold, what was going to be published. And a lot of these great Catholic authors, authors ended up essentially white martyrs because yes. they couldn't get published yep. or promoted or, or marketed. And so we need to re read them. Uh, so let's take a break. We'll be back in just a moment with your questions for Joseph Pierce and about his writing and maybe about our need to read more good books. Welcome back to The Journey Home. My guest tonight is uh, Joseph Pierce. He's a wonderful author. Uh, how many books have you published at this point? I think it's about 12. About 12? Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm familiar with the four and then a fifth. You had the book about Oscar Wilde, and you have a novel also out there? Yeah, one, uh, novel, one novel only, and uh, Life of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Russian, and, and right. others. You've been busy. <laughs> That's great. Uh, you know, sometimes when we tell the whole story, we leave a couple loose ends. And I want to make sure we clear up one. You're no longer a card-carrying member of the Orange Men, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think if I, if, I try, if I try to get anywhere near a lodge, Orange Lodge, I'd get uh, lynched. <laughs> it wouldn't be very wise. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to clear that one up. Let's take our first caller here. Hello, what's your name and where are you calling from? Hello. Hello. This is Madeline from California. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? Hello. Hello, can you hear me? We'll have to come back to Madeline. No, I here I am. Oh, hi, Madeline. Hello. What's your question for us? <laughs> Good evening, gentlemen. Hello. Sorry about the mix-up. That's right. I enjoy very much this program, but one thing I have never heard covered, or at least so slightly that it went by me, I know your coming into the church was very much an intellectual one, but Mr. Pierce, were you ever affected or disaffected by the good or bad example of practicing Catholics. Oh, Madeline, thank you for that call. Excellent question, because it is a good one. Well, actually, I think that I'd have to say that possibly the answer to that might be yes, but perhaps not in the way you're expecting. Um, that when I was involved in politics, there were people that were Catholics, and uh, some of them were, were friends of mine, but it just seemed to me that there, that there seemed to be a lack of charity in, in, their, in their vision, um, which probably explains why they were in the same, the same politics as I was. Um, <laughs> so I suppose that was what you could call, in some sense, is a negative uh, vision. But then on saying that, actually, thinking aloud here, um, that one, I remember one, a couple of them did actually take me to Mass you know, when I was very young. And, that they, and when I actually went to Mass, it had an extremely positive impact on me, and I have to thank them for that. And, of course, there's the friend that sent me the rosary in prison. Yeah, there's the witness. So, uh, I would say that the very limited, very, very limited uh, dealings I had with Catholics before my conversion um, what would, have been, uh, would have been positive, actually. All right, thank you, Joseph. Let's take our first email, Father Stephen, uh, I think it's Nass, from Michigan. Uh, where you where you okay stay you ought to know him right you're in michigan <laughs> i don't Big know every piece in michigan i only lived there eight <laughs> weeks <laughs> all right give you a couple more weeks yeah, yeah sure okay. uh dear mr pierce in the earlier part of the 20th century there was a were a great many converts to catholicism in england from among writers poets and journalists the great jake chesterton Evelyn Waugh, dame edith stillwell came to mind could this type of thing happen again 
Can you think of any modern person whose conversion would have this effect? And I, I presume he's talking about the English environment today, which does not seem very receptive. To yeah, well, I think that's a good point. And one of the things which was a little bit sad in writing literary converts is the realization, if I'm to be honest, that uh, that the thing begin to, began to dry up a little bit uh, from the 1960s onwards. But I see no reason at all why there shouldn't be uh, a renewal of the Catholic literary revival. There's no reason why not. There's uh, uh, plenty of, of grounds for, for, for the Catholic novel, for Catholic poetry. And indeed, that's one of the purposes mm -hmm. of the St. Austin Review. We publish new poetry and new short stories. Um, we, so I think that indeed that, that, that there is every possibility that, uh, that the, the Catholic Church uh, could have renewal in, in the 21st century. I see no reason uh, at all why not. And indeed, one of the things I'm trying to do <laughs> is, 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 is to f facilitate that. Well, I, I think you're looking at uh, one of those right now is an English author is going to have a great impact. Uh, but isn't it true also that there are some prominent Catholic converts in England right now? If really, I've been, I've been in the Catholic Church for, um, for 11 or 12 years, 12 years. And when I, when I first uh, became a Catholic, 1989 to 2001, I would say that things have got better and better and better. When I first came in, there were many grounds for assuming that things were pretty bad. But now, you see newspaper editors, members of the royal family, members of the aristocracy, members of parliament, members of the House of Lords, all of a sudden it's become uh, do we good, become very fashionable mm. to, to, become, to become a Catholic. Now fashion, of course, is something we have to be very careful of, <laughs> but nonetheless, you know, uh, all of a sudden the Catholic Church isn't something people are ashamed of any longer. You know, I think the, the, the state of the Anglican Church, the Church of England, you know, uh, being in such disarray at the moment, a lot of people are seeing the Catholic Church as the only part of Christianity which is standing completely firm to the traditional yeah. teachings. And this is something which is attracting many people. And say, many, many of the leading journalists in, uh, in England at the moment uh, have become Catholics, and there's at least a possibility now that, okay, journalism may not be high literature, but it's literature, and it's moving in the right direction. And it could be we're seeing the beginning of a, of a renewal of the Catholic literature revival even as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, an early edition of the Coming Home Network's uh, brochure that we used to hand out had a statement in there that said that many of us converts, when we look at our journey into the church, we feel a lot like the prodigal son coming back. Yeah. And it was interesting that I had received a letter from an Anglican bishop that was very offended that I would describe the conversion from Anglicanism to the Catholic Church like a prodigal son coming home. But yet I look at the state of England and the state of the Church of England, and is it possible that what the Lord is allowing happen in England is the very experience of the prodigal son, and maybe this will awaken in many a rediscovery of the Catholic faith. Well, all I can say is that uh, certainly my very words upon being received, the local parish made, made me a cake, and all that I could think of to say, because I didn't realize it was a surprise, all that I could think of to say was, I, I've come home. Yeah. And that is certainly the feeling that, 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 that I have and that converts do have. And as regards God working in mysterious ways, the Anglican Church um, in England uh, is in such disarray, but it's worked to the, in, in the diocese where I lived in East Anglia. We were saved by the crisis in the Anglican Church because we had a crisis of, of a shortage of priests. Hmm. You know, and we had dozens of Anglicans that coming over that were ordained priests, and so they became Catholic priests. And the, the local pra parish priest in the small country town I lived the in Lord provides. was a form. Exactly, the Lord provides. Exactly. Uh, why don't we take our next caller, Sam from New Jersey. What's your question for us tonight? Uh, hi, Marcus. Hi, Mr. Pierce. Hi. Um, my question is the, the great uh, Catholic writer J.R.R. Tolkien, yeah. who was, uh, I'm not sure if he was a convert or, or, or what, uh, the writer of Lord of the Rings. How does, where does he fit into, uh, into, these, uh, into these great writers? Is, is he anywhere in there? Thank you very much for asking that question. It was on my list, and I was, was, was hoping it would come on a phone call, because that's an important question to ask right now. Well, I, I can honestly say that I'm delighted that you asked the question, because um, he should, he's not only on the list, he's probably top of it. Um, and uh, he, to answer your question, he's, uh, I never know whether to call him a convert or not. He's a cradle convert, um, mm -hmm. in the sense that his mother 
was a convert when he was uh, a, a boy, and then he was received into the church. Um, but The Lord of the Rings is a profoundly Christian work and was voted uh, by l loads of opinion polls uh, as the greatest book of the century, the 20th amazing. century in England. Uh, it's amazing how many lists kept putting that number one every yeah, time I turned. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, the people said, oh, the Tolkien Society are fixing it. And in the end, the Folio Society, there's a private organization with 50,000 uh, members, but paid up members, so no one could infiltrate and you know, ask for the greatest book of all time. You know, and third place was, was, was uh, David Copperfield by Dickens. You know, second place was Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, and top was Lord of the Rings by Tolkien. Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, the, the, the secularists just don't know what to do about it, because the whole point about Tolkien's book is that good and evil exist, mm -hmm. that there's one God above it all, and that everything is working in some mysterious providential way. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and this is not the way that liberal secularists living in a relativistic universe you know, want us to be seeing the world. You know, that re evil really is just you know, it's your idea of evil, my idea of evil. You know. But not, Tolkien says, no, evil is black, evil is dark, evil is destructive, evil destroys souls. You know, did, did Tolkien talk at all about his the relationship between his own the Catholic convictions and the writing of... of uh, oh yes, he, had, he, he wrote specifically about a scale of significance. Uh, in the writing of Lord of the Rings, and at the very top of the scale of significance, he said that, that um, he said, I am a Christian, which can be deduced from my writings, mm. and specifically a Roman Catholic. Mm. So and he made that as the most important factor in the writing of the Lord of the Rings. Interesting. Very interesting. You know, we were talking about earlier, the question was about c Catholic writers today that might influence a movement. And tell me if you, would you see this as true, is that when I look at those great Catholic writers, whether they're converts, or lifelong Catholics, um, what the reason that I think they were able to influence even non-Catholics is that they didn't only write books in the Catholic realm, is they were widely written so that someone would pick up, like in Europe, pick up a book about Solzhenitsyn, and they would like that, and then they'll say, well, what else has he written? Yeah. Isn't that also a key to reaching out? Yeah, I think that the key thing, I mean, Tolkien is a perfect example of this, because Tolkien didn't like allegory. Uh, and allegory sort of being where you have a point, and then you make your story fit your point. He just believed that, that all story comes from God, because mm. he saw story as being creative. Mm. And he, we made an image of God, God is the creator, and therefore we are, in our act of crea creativity, are actually um, partaking of that imageness of God in us. So he believed that if you just write a story, and love God, then God will work through the story anyway. And someone said to Tolkien, you don't really believe you wrote that yourself, do you? <laughs> you know, and I, and I don't, uh, Tolkien didn't for a moment think he wrote it himself. He thought it was, he was, he was responding and cooperating with grace, mm -hmm. and, and, and our Lord was the co-author. Well, there's a sense in which you're, you're a committed Catholic, you understand the Catholic faith, you live and believe in the Catholic faith, so that out of your heart comes these stories that fit yes. that, that understanding of reality. Precisely. I mean, if you, if you just look upon creativity as being something which is God-given and requires grace, you know, mm. and so you go into every single creative act knowing that you can only do this through the grace of God with his cooperation, and then you let it flow. Now, the words will be God's as well as your own, and the Catholicism the truth, the Christianity, will come out exude. in the story. It if you're writing honestly, can you read backwards? Let's say you pick up a book where it's bent, the reality of good and evil is bent. Yeah, I mean, I, is it justifiable to read backwards and say, I wonder where this author is coming from? Well, I think, I think the thing is that the, the language of literature is truth, because we can't create anything. I mean, we, we are not creators. We live in a created universe. Mm -hmm. So all that we can do is mold the facts and the truths of life, the loves, the hates, the betrayals, the loyalties, into some form, some sculptured form. Now, if you have uh, a bent mentality, you create something ugly. Yeah. But you still create something ugly from truths because you can't create yeah. a truth for yourself. Yeah. So the thing you're molding is truth, but you just, you just disfigured it into some ugly form. Yeah. Well, Jesus talked about that, good and bad fruit. Yes, exactly. Good fruit from a good tree. And, exactly. Uh, and, yeah. and then vice versa. Let's take our next caller, Dan from Wisconsin. What's your question for us? Yes, I'd like to comment on Arnold Knox's book called Enthusiasm. Yes. Uh, I'll look at that then. Thanks. Oh, you want to? <laughs> I'll comment we, on it, yes. Okay. 
Thanks for that. Thanks, Dean. I thought you were going to give a comment. Yes, okay. Well, I'm very pleased that I can come all the way to Alabama and speak to someone from Wisconsin and be discussing Ronald Knox. <laughs> uh, Ronald Knox is a sadly neglected writer, and enthusiasm was uh, you know, a very, very powerful work of apologetics, uh, very influential in its time, uh, and I'm glad that people are still out there reading it. I'm not aware that it's back in print, but uh, mm -hmm. obviously some people are getting hold of it. Um, I just know that it was uh, Ronald Knox's sort of uh, probably his greatest ap apologetic work uh, and was very influential, I think, on Evening War uh, and I think possibly on T.S. Eliot. Would you simply say that that book was, was dealing with those who run after religions because they feel good? Well, I, th I think he was just looking at the, um, the, the, the psyche of his age, something mm -hmm. which, which Chesterton and Belloc did very well as well, looking at the way people are taking takes on religion mm -hmm. and looking at it but from a very Catholic perspective mm -hmm. and, uh, and sort of, I should say, sort of getting at the truth through that. In other words, taking the modern mind where it is, confronting the modern mind where it is, uh, looking at it from the from the, the viewpoint of the church, and the church, of course, has 2,000 years of wisdom to draw on mm. that isn't a slave to the fashions of the age. And Knox was very good at that in his, in his satire as well, at seeing how the modern mind works, and, and, but then analyzing it clinically, because he had a brilliant, brilliant mm. mind and a very witty and good... You know, in a wonderful translation of the Bible. Oh, yes, it's indeed. A translation <laughs> Again, of the Bible. Yeah, of course. Uh, that's exactly. Uh, did a great Time, translation. Timeless English is, is what he was aiming for. Yeah, that translation. That's a beautiful translation. Yeah. Let's take this email. It comes from Lucy in Tennessee. Dear Joseph and Marcus, what should I, an ordinary Catholic, use as my criterion for choosing good books to read? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I resist the temptation to say mine. Well, um, I will say that. You know, <laughs> <go ahead. laughs> um, I think that possibly um, that, uh, that literary converts might be a good start, not the book itself, but because it will give you a list of all of these writers of the 20th century, uh, which will sort of open up a mine, uh, you know, a, a gold mine of good Catholic 20th century literature, and you can then just go and select from it. But certainly uh, I would make a point of, of, it depends of course whether you like novels or poetry, but if you love poetry, Gerard Manley Hopkins, the Jesuit, and T.S. Eliot, uh, Siegfried Sassoon, a wonderful Not necessarily poets. easy to always understand. Um, well, I think, that, I think that they're easy to understand if you, if you take your time to read yeah, them. I think okay. the, the thing about poetry is it sh it's not something that you read quickly. Right. Or it shouldn't, right. Or good poetry right. shouldn't be. Uh, but certainly the, the, the novels of Evening War, anything by Chesterton and Belloc. Um, Let me ask you this, as you were using, looking for a criteria. That's a hard one, you go into a huge bookstore. Would you say a good publisher is a trustworthy way? Certainly, a good publisher is a, is a trustworthy way. There is a problem with criteria, though, because everybody's a, a, an individual. Yeah. I mean, Especially I would today. I would certainly recommend uh, the Lord of the Rings to anybody, but I'm well aware that that that, that sort of book leaves some right. people cold. That's right. So it's difficult to say you know, what is a criteria. But certainly, a, a good publisher is a good is a good starting point. But of course, a publisher is limited in what they do. Yeah. Even then, so Ignatius Press, for instance, is a good publisher. But uh, you know that they only do a certain yep. sort of sphere of books. Well, so you know, if you, it's, you might want to connect your criteria, you might want to connect with the, the same thing about listen to people that you trust. Yes. Ask them what they read and yes. what. I mean, that's and we try and do that here on television, of course. But you know, look, ask your priest or ask people that you trust. What do they read? What do they recommend? And uh, you know, it's interesting. People like Chesterton. I mean, you have his apologetic works, uh, orthodoxy, and then you have the Father. Brown yeah. series. So he's, yeah. he's such a wide writer. Uh, yeah. uh, wonderful thing. Joseph, how has coming into the Catholic Church drawn you closer to the Lord Jesus? Well, I think that overall I see it as a just a glorious healing process. That I um, started off embittered, in the dark, uh, groping, and he's taken me, he's loved me, and for a period now of over 20 years, he's lovingly brought me to him, in spite of my best efforts. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I really, I, I, that's the way I see it, it's a healing process, and now I have a heart which is, um, which is in love with him and feels loved, and I feel that life is, uh, is a joy. 
is literally a joy, and it's thanks to him. Well, you were given that little string of beads at the prison. Did you ever get beyond uh, the, the, the self-made prayers with the rosary? Oh, I think I've learned how to say the rosary now. Has, has it been an important part of your own journey? Uh, the, the rosary is a very important part of my spirituality. Um, and uh, once I learned to say it, it's, I, I just, there's so much in it. You know, the, you, the, the, whole, the whole divine symmetry of, you know, of joy, sorrow, glory, you know, that, that you need all three, and those three in balance seem to make some, some beautiful whole. You know, it's, to me, it's, it's been central to, the, to, to my, my whole spiritual life. So that first rosary bead was in. I still have it. <laughs> it's broken a bit. I can't use it. It's hanging up. Well, you know, the thing that, one of the things I discovered about the rosary is that even though you can know each of the mysteries, let's say the Annunciation, right, the Visitation, or we can jump ahead to the Resurrection, uh, each mystery, that from a meditative standpoint, you can take a different perspective within each mystery from the story, and it's almost an infinite way of understanding. You know, the, the angel's perspective, Mary's perspective, uh, a bystander's perspective, uh, you know, how Mary... In fact, the beauty of knowing that the only reason that we know anything about Christ's childhood is because it was Mary who must have told it to the apostles Yes, that ended up in the gospel. So we have her connection with all yes. of that. And I think I asked you at one point uh, in an earlier discussion that, that, that like so many other converts, Mary, in fact, was one of the harder barriers for you at first. Is that yes. you yeah, like it, going it was, a little bit? It was probably the, the, um, one of the, the, the barriers to my, my conversion, one of the things that slowed me down, if you like, one of, maybe one of Satan's last efforts to keep me out. <laughs> um, but it was, you know, the, the whole Marian devotion seemed to, seemed, I mean, you can imagine if you're brought up as, you know, with the whole tradition of, of uh, the anti-Catholic Protestant perspective, and you've been in the Orange Order, you know, then, uh, you know, where they, where they yeah. say very, very uncharitable things about the relationship between the Church and, and the Blessed Virgin, you know, to overcome those prejudices. But, you know, but basically, in the end, uh, the, the whole concept of the Mother of God is so profound and so profoundly true. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, once you actually start you, you know, asking her to intercede for you, you know, the, the, the effect, the power, and, and certainly these things perhaps are very intimate, so I won't go into details, but uh, there have been uh, on several occasions in my life where she has intervened in an, a very, very specific, particular way at a particular moment and has had a, 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 a changing effect on my life. You, whenever I have a guest like you, it's just a reminder of what God's grace can do. You know that old phrase, but for the grace of God go I. You know, and we recognize, in fact, the fact that you recognize the, the um, intercession of Mary in an event in your life is a work of grace. Because otherwise you'd say, oh, that was coincidence or... Yeah. But to be able to see, I must confess, actually, I'm I'm fairly unsubtle in many ways, and uh, I think she knows that. <laughs> <laughs> when 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 she's intervened in my life, she, she's made it so obvious. That <laughs> I can't have any, even been in the coincidence, I'm afraid. So I don't have that excuse. <laughs> well, I appreciate I appreciate your witness in your books, and again, I can't give a stronger recommendation uh, to the audience. And I want before we we close, I want to give one more uh, plug, if I can. Uh, for the journal, the St. Austin Review Star uh, Reclaiming Culture Journal. What are some of the themes of this journal coming out that would be helpful for those, especially those that are not sure of the Catholic Church and they're on the journey? Yeah, well, I mean, so the, the, the um, next issue is the Christmas issue, which looks obviously at uh, the, the importance and significance of, of Christmas, the, the presence that Christmas presents. Uh, the next, the January issue, which may be interesting for one of your readers at least, is that it's, it's a Tolkien special issue to right. discuss aspects. Very you know. timely. But then we have Shakespeare and Catholicism, and you know, uh, basically it's a different theme, and it's all about reclaiming culture for the Church, for Christendom. All right, Joseph, thank you very much. My pleasure. Being on a journey home, and thank you for your work and helping reclaim culture. I well, mean, your you works have me. a great part in that, and also your work at Ave Maria College. You're a writer in residence, is that what it's at called? Ave Maria, yeah. Ave right. Maria at yeah. college, and so thank you for that and your witness. And thank you for joining us on the journey home. I hope this program has been an encouragement to you to pick up those great books, take time to read, and know that because of the commitment of the authors, that the Lord will speak through them to your heart. God bless you. I'll be with you again. <laughs>